morning and not wear and not wear ourselves. We bless the Lord and we give him all the praise of all the marvelous things he's done for us. We come today to glorify the mighty name of Jesus, to lift him up, to magnify him and make him bigger than any problem and circumstance in our lives. On today, our prayer mountain is education. Spirit of the only true and living God, we pray for your protection over all the schools. We ask for strength and courage and a spirit of wisdom to guide our students through the tasks in which they've been assigned. We pray for eagerness to learn. We pray for families in every district, oh God. We pray that our students won't become distracted and they will feel a spirit of peace and love. We pray for love and joy. We pray for their educational experience to be filled with the wonder of learning. Lord God, we pray for our principals. We pray for all school board members, teachers, and et cetera. We pray for our students who are struggling, oh God, and we thank you right now, oh God, for interceding on their behalf and giving them the power and the wisdom to do what you've assigned them to do. We pray, oh God, for the students who have no motivation, oh God, but we pray even now that they will be motivated to excel. We pray for daycare centers, oh God, we pray for elementary, middle, high, and universities. We pray for safety. We pray for our bus operators, to security officers, cafeteria staff, custodians, recreational centers, and after-school care. We pray for daycare owners and workers, private and public universities. Lord God, we come against the spirit of the enemy. We bind the spirit of bullying. We bind the spirit of murder, suicide hopelessness, and confusion. Lord God, we honor you on today, and we ask you even now to bless our children as never before. We pray even now that they will be recipients of the honor roll, promotions, graduations, scholarships, and degrees. And all this will be done for your glory, and we will continue to give you the praise. We ask for your continued blessing on the educational system. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen to God be the glory. Today's lesson is coming from Kingdom 365, our devotional by Dr. Demetrius Robinson. It is day 275. Our topic is the fatted calf. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. Luke 15, 23. The text we are considering today is the story of the prodigal son. This story is well known for it talks about the younger son who was asked for his inheritance while his father was still alive. When this was done, it conveys the meaning that the son wishes that the father were dead. So the father gives the younger son his inheritance and the son begins to spend his inheritance until it was all gone. And he was about to eat the pigs, eat with the pigs, when the Bible says he came to himself and remembered the father's house. The son made the journey from a far country back to his father's house. And when his father saw him afar, he ran and welcomed his son back home. He says to his servants, kill the fatted calf. It is customary when a family is to celebrate that they would kill a lamb because the lamb feeds about 15 to 20 people. This is enough for your immediate family and those who just hang around your house. To kill a fatted calf means that you're going to feed an entire village. You see, when his son returned home, there were those who said he would never come back. And all the naysayers were coming to the feast. God promised to prepare a table before you, even in the midst of our enemies. Let's get the grill out. Amen. To God be the glory. We'll be coming from uh, Luke, the 15th chapter, beginning at the first verse. And we'll kind of skip around. Jesus was speaking to the outcasts of society because they were drawn to him. There was something about Jesus that even the people that weren't saved were drawn to him. And he took time with them. But the religious leaders were determined to have Jesus killed because he received sinners and he ate with them. 
they did not understand how he could be Jesus and how he could have fellowship with the sinners. Four, he asked, what man of you having 100 sheep, if you lose one of them, does not leave the 99 to go after the one which is lost until he finds it? He lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing, because he's obligated to the master to see that none of the sheep are lost. He's obligated to the master to see that none of them are killed or injured. He says, rejoice with me. I have found my sheep that was lost. I say to you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 who need no repentance. Verse number eight is talking about the lowest coin. A woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one, doesn't she light the lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully for it until she finds it? And when she does, she calls all her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which was lost. 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is a great example of joy that is expected when something that was lost is now found. Don't you know how happy you are when you are able to find your purse that was lost? Don't you know how happy you become when you're able to find your keys that were lost, your cell phone that was lost, and your money that was lost? Glory be to God. Verse number 11 talks about the lost son. This is one of the longest and most detailed parables, hallelujah, in the Bible. 11, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, and the father, the father is also your source. So he said to his source, please give me the portion of my goods that fall to me. What a shocking request. It's almost like saying, I can't wait until you die. So the father glory be to God, gave him his full portion, which was a third of the entire estate. The oldest brother got a double portion. How many of us have refused a relationship with the father, but we want all of his benefits? All our prayers are selfish. Give me, give me, give me. Lord, I need this. I need that. Give me my goods, but there's no relationship formed with the father. Verse 13. Not many days after, the younger son got his possessions and he went to a faraway country. You notice that the father did not hinder him. Knowing that the safest place was in the father's house and the father also knew that this boy was not mature enough to navigate his life, but he did not hinder him. He did not chase after him. He did not coddle him. He refused to enable him. He allowed him to lead. He released him. Many times we have to let our children grow, go and face the hard, cruel world. He was partying and enjoying life. He wasted all of his possessions with prodigal living. Prodigal living and prodigal spending means spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully, extravagantly. What was it that caused him to seek the pleasures of the world and walk outside of the safety and the provision of the father's house? We're drawn away by our own lust. So many of us have walked away from the will of God because of what we wanted. We are drawn away. Glory be to God. Verse 14. When he spent all, there was a famine. 15. He began to feed the swine. This was horrendous because the Jews considered the swine as the worst kind of unclean animal. I believe the father knew that his son was in distress. Yes, he stood his ground. He didn't send out an APB. He didn't find an ABBA report. He didn't alert, hallelujah, the police department. He didn't place fires out on, on posts. He did not inform the television stations. Sometimes we have to allow our kids to hit rock bottom while we stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 16, he was starving. 
and he desired to eat the pods that were what that was what the swines ate. But the pods were undigestible for humans. The only reason he didn't eat it was because he couldn't. No one gave him anything. All the people that he parted with, all the people that he took care of, nobody gave him anything. He couldn't even make a living by begging. This symbolizes the state of a sinner that is helpless and in despair without reaching out to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. 17, eventually he had an aha moment. He came to his senses realizing that his constant sinning left him bankrupt and hungry. He began to think and move more clearly, which made him a prime candidate for salvation. First of all, you must realize that you're lost. And we understand that this entire chapter is talking about being lost and found. He understood that he was lost. Matthew 5, 3 through 6 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We understand he's empty now. And he needs to be empty of himself so he can be filled with the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. 17. But when he came to himself, he said, hallelujah, many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare. And I perish and almost starved to death from hunger. 18. I will rise and go to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. First of all, you understand the enemy's job is to take you down. I thank God he said, I, he rose and he said, I'm going to go to my father's house. He understood that he had sinned against heaven and against his father. That was the confession, understanding the fact that he was wrong and out of order. He was a sinner. 19, he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He's rehearsing to himself what he's going to tell his daddy. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the hired servants. He's just rehearsing and rehearsing. What makes him feel that his actions disqualify him from being a son? We're sons of God. And the enemy tries to convince us that when we fail and when we sin or when we rebel, we have been demoted. We are so loved by the Father. Glory be to God. He has unconditional love, agape love. Romans 8, 35. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck. The father had been looking for his son. Compassion does away with tradition. Compassion does away with the traditions of man because it was very undignified for him to run. Glory be to God. But he ran. Not only did he run, he protected his son. He understood that his son really could have been stoned to death by the elders for being a stubborn and rebellious child. Deuteronomy 8, 18 through 21 he did not get what he deserved. Glory be to God. He got the love of a father. The, the father kissed him, signifying a covenant agreement. 21. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That made me think about my children. I have six children. One of them is on drugs. That does not negate the fact that he is still my son. That does not negate the fact that I still love him. No matter what he does, I do not love him less. I do not love him less than my children that are college graduates. He's my son. I understand, hallelujah, that he's lost. But I'm standing at the door waiting for him to come home so I can welcome him with welcome, with welcome arms and love. And I can kiss him and let him know that he's always been my child. He's always been my son. Because we've all seen to come short. 22, 
Bring out the best robe. Hallelujah. Give him the best robe. The best robe is probably the father's robe. And the, the best robe is always reserved for the guest of honor. 23, give him a ring. Put the ring on his finger. This is a code of honor. Glory be to God. Put sandals on his feet, which indicate he is a son and not a slave. Usually slaves didn't own sandals. 23, bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let's eat and be merry. 24, for this my son was dead. Glory be to God. And now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. The fatted calf had been set aside, glory be to God, and it got and received special treatment, glory be to God. It was fatter than all the rest of them, and it had been separated, hallelujah. It was set aside, it was sanctified so that it received special attention. When it's used, it's used for special occasions and celebration for someone who has been away for a long time. Kill the fatted cow. 25. The older son was in the field. He heard the music and dancing. He heard the DJ playing all kinds of songs. And he wanted to know what was going on. 26. He called the servant and asked, what's going on? 27. Your brother, glory be to God. Hallelujah. Your brother has come. And because he your father has received him. He is safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted cow. 28. The brother was angry. He wouldn't go in. Therefore, the father came out and begged him, please come inside. Please come inside. This was such a disrespect to the father. 29. He said, look, that's no way to talk to your dad. Look, all these years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandments at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. Oh, glory be to God. It really shows you how he's like the religious hypocrites, never recognizing their own sins, and they refuse to repent. This boy has the same spirit of the Pharisees, glory be to God, and the scribes. All those years of service were motivated by what he wanted and what he could get for himself, not because he loved his father. He was selfish. His behavior was horrible. And even though society may have seen him as being acceptable because he was doing, you know, the church thing, and society may have looked at the brother as being foolish because of his folly, but the older brother's hard partial was evil. And he was equally dishonored. He equally dishonored his father just as the younger son did. Even though you kept the rules, your hard partial was evil. You were selfish and you too need to repent. Just because you're in church doing church things, what is your heart partial? Why do you do what you do? Ah, glory. Verse 13. The son of yours, this is what he says now. This son of yours, he refused to call this boy his brother. How bitter can you be? This son of yours, ha, glory be to God. This shows you such a root of bitterness and jealousy. 31, all I have is yours, the father is saying. You had your inheritance. Everything the father had already belonged to the elder son. He hated the love that was shown to the prodigal, like the Pharisees and scribes. He had easy access to the riches of God's truth, just like the Pharisees did, just like the scribes. They had access to the truth of God, but they spent their lives dealing with the scripture and dealing with public worship, but never having a personal relationship. They never possessed the joy that the sinner receives. Glory be to God, when they repent and have a real relationship with the Lord. Yes, the scribes and Pharisees knew the word, but they had no joy. They were evil and bitter. 32. It's right that we should make merry. 
Because if we can make merry over somebody finding a sheep, if we can make merry over somebody finding a coin, why is it we can't make merry over somebody that's finding their way back to the Father? This is the point of all three of the parables. Rejoice, glory be to God, over the sheep, over the coin. But most of all, enjoy, rejoice over your brother who is alive again. Hallelujah. This boy was lost, but now he's found. But not only was the prodigal lost, the son that was at home was lost. It's a sad thing to be lost in the father's house. So let's party. This was the greatest day for the father. For the son, it was a wonderful day because his son had only taken from his father and brought shame and embarrassment. For him to be received with unconditional love was a sign of God's grace and mercy. The village, for the village, this was an unforgettable party because meat was a delicacy. That fattened calf would be able to feed about 100 people. So everyone in the village was happy except the older son. He was so angry about the fatted calf. He was angry about the village people being happy. The servants were even excited that the prodigal had returned. They threw him a puck, but the son, the oldest son, was so rude and so nasty. Glory be to God. He threw a public tantrum and a fit. He was livid. Everybody else had gathered to celebrate reconciliation, but they witnessed a public rift between the father, the son, and his brother. Just as great as the young son's departure was, at least he departed at night and he left quietly. This boy made a public spectacle. He was rude and disrespectful. He shamed his father in the audience of hundreds of people. Two sons with awful behavior. One shamed the father by being in a pigsty. The other shames the family in the backyard. This father bears the shame of both of his rebellious sons. The father begged the son to join the party because he really wanted the son to be there, but he only rendered to his father disrespect. The older son relates to the father like a slave instead of a, like a son. He does not understand that everything that the father had belonged to him. He was not a, a slave, he was a son, but his mindset was wrong. He felt like the younger son gained everything and he had nothing. Neither one of these boys really had a genuine relationship with their father. They were more consumed about what the father could provide for them. In the beginning of the text at the top of the 15th verse, the tax collectors and all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered and complained. This man welcomed sinners and eats with them. Now we can tell who these two brothers really are. The younger son is like the tax collector and the sinners. He lived his life to the fullest. He parted, but there was something that kept, that drew him just as the sinners and the tax collectors were drawn to Jesus. Even though he parted, he was drinking, he was a homemonger, he was still drawn to Jesus. The younger son sought the father. The oldest son was like the Pharisees and the scribes. He was self-righteous, hallelujah, and had no real relationship with his father. He was lost and needed to be found. The scripture really doesn't tell us what happened to the oldest son because one thing about it, he was offered a choice. He had a decision to make. Which one of these boys do we relate to? At the end of the day, when a soul has been saved, and is no longer lost, heaven rejoice. So let us party, 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 and let us kill the fatted half. God bless you. Back into your hands, Sister Sarah.